So this is part two of control of gene expression. And in it, we're going to discuss how eukaryotic cells control their gene expression, which is very different than prokaryotic cells. So before we talked about operons in bacteria, uh, now we're gonna talk about uh, something a little bit different. So if we go back and look at this again, so remember that uh, we have this transcription process of DNA to RNA, translation of RNA to protein, um, and eukaryotic cells are going to use both uh, transcription and translation to control these processes. So what helps to look at is how uh, genes are set up differently in eukaryotic organisms. So in eukaryotic organisms, uh, we have our promoter region. Now we talked about this in class, that we have this kind of uh, weirdly named region of the promoter, this thing called the Tata box. Uh, it's called that because the genetic code actually reads thymine, adenine, thymine, adenine. Um, but this region is where we're going to have proteins called transcription factors attached to the promoter. Now, this region of the promoter right here is where my RNA polymerase will bind. So I actually need both these proteins, these transcription factors, and the RNA polymerase in order to then do transcription of this gene right here. Now, the other thing that's different is in eukaryotic cells above the gene, and we call this being upstream of the gene. So here's my promoter. This is downstream of the gene because I'm gonna read the gene in this direction. Upstream of the gene, we have this thing called an enhancer. And this is a region of protein uh, or of the DNA that a protein called an activator will attach to. So I need the activator and these transcription factors to actually turn on this gene. Now these transcription factors are released within the cell. They're released by cells, other cells that are outside this one. So these things are used to actually turn on the process of gene expression. Now what's different about eukaryotes is you actually have to get a change in shape of the DNA molecule. So we'll attach this activator here to the enhancer. We'll attach the RNA polymerase and the transcription factor, but the transcription factors kind of hold onto the RNA polymerase. They don't go anywhere. So what happens is the DNA actually has to fold and you can see it's got this bend here so that the activator attached to the enhancer touches the transcription factor. Once that happens, the RNA polymerase is released and that gene gets expressed. So if the cell wants to control its gene expression, it has to basically have a whole bunch of these transcription factors. Usually there's several that have to be present in the cell in order for get, to get this gene to be expressed. And these transcription factors may be made by other genes that are activating this particular gene. So that process is very, very different. So this, is a way that we can control this process transcriptionally. But we can also control this process a little bit differently. One of the things that happens in eukaryotic DNA is the DNA is not a loop as it is in prokaryotic cells. The DNA is broken up into strands, into fragments, and then these fragments are wrapped around a protein. So this is showing you here DNA, which is in blue, wrapped around this protein. Now this protein is called a histone. The idea here is it's a way to package or fold up the DNA so that I can fit all of it in the nucleus because eukaryotic cells have a lot of DNA in their nucleus. This is a way to fold and organize. Now the problem here is when I wrap the DNA around this protein, it actually blocks the ability of RNA polymerase to stick to the DNA. So if there was a promoter right here where I'm highlighting, that wouldn't that RNA polymerase wouldn't be able to stick there. So we have this issue. This is a really efficient way to store the DNA, but it's problematic when I want to express the genes. So eukaryotic cells have to deal with this. And they do this in several different ways. One of the ways they do this is they actually slide this particular protein down the DNA. So imagine I had a string wrapped around like a hockey puck. Um, if I slid the loops of that string down, I would actually, you know, move the string. So if my, my histone was right here, I'd slide it down and then I would expose that part of the DNA that had the promoter in it. Um, you can also, the cells can also um, 
basically remodel or remove this protein. Um, so we can change the shape of this protein, we can remove the protein, uh, or we can displace it um, and then replace it with another protein. So in any of these cases, we have to remove these histone proteins or get them out of the way uh, before we can express the genes in eukaryotic cells. So this is sort of a barrier to transcription. Now in translation, and this is what's different about eukaryotic cells, um, eukaryotic cells can actually ch uh, choose whether certain messenger RNAs get transcribed into, or uh, translated, excuse me, into protein. And this works, and by the way, we don't know a lot about this, but we are getting a better understanding. We have these things called microRNAs. So the miRNA here stands for microRNA. These microRNAs are built from genes in the nucleus. So they are actually transcribed, but rather than be translated into proteins, these RNA molecules are chopped up in the nucleus here. Um, they actually leave the nucleus. They get modified by this protein called dicer, which I just think is hilarious. Um, and they become this molecule called the mature microRNA. That mature microRNA then binds to a protein in the nucleus and it attaches to the uh, messenger RNA. So here's my messenger RNA. Here again, my orange and red are these ribosomes. The ribosomes get blocked by these microRNAs. So this we've found to be a very important processing step in um, how the gene actually gets translated. We're still learning a lot about this, but this may be a really good way to control, for example, cells that are diseased, like cancer cells. If we can figure out a way to activate these microRNAs in these cancer cells, we may be able to block some of the proteins that these cancer cells are making. So microRNA is an example of how you can control gene expression after uh, transcription. Now, one of the things that happens, and I just wanted to mention this, is we have this issue. When we express genes in eukaryotic cells, um, we can actually create a whole bunch of proteins from just a few genes. So there's this idea that's called one gene, one protein. This idea was put forward that says for every genetic code that you have, you make exactly one protein. Now, the problem we have is if you look at humans, humans have here 25,000 genes, thereabouts. Our cells can make oh, about 100,000 or so proteins. So the question is, how does that happen? <clears throat> how can you have, if, only, if one gene codes for one protein, how do you get this? Well, this has been explained actually by this process called uh, alternative sp splicing. And here's an example of this. So remember we talked about we have these exons, which are these things in yellow. We have introns, which are these things in purple. When I go to make the messenger RNA, the mature messenger RNA, I splice out the introns. But you can also splice out some of the exons. So an example of this, there's this gene that we have that actually makes two kinds of proteins. This one called calcitonin, which is used to regulate uh, blood calcium levels. And then this other one called calcium gene related, or sorry, calcitonin gene related protein. This one controls inflammation in the membranes surrounding the brain. So in the thyroid gland, you make calcitonin. You do alternative splicing in the brain and the hypothalamus to produce this protein. So I get one gene, but two proteins from it because of being able to splice out exons along with introns. Now, the last way we have to control transcription translation is this protein called ubiquitin. So this purple thing is ubiquitin. What it does is it sticks to proteins and then marks those proteins for recycling. So these proteins get marked with ubiquitin. They get transported to a structure in the cell that breaks down or degrades that protein. And we get these polypeptide fragments that then can be can turned back into other proteins. So again, this is a post-translational thing.